Welcome to the Rogue Wave Podcast, the frequency for all things pop culture and the disruptors behind it. We talk comics, movies, TV, and pop culture every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern on Facebook.com slash Rogue Wave Podcast and Twitch.tv slash Rogue Wave Podcast. Download this immediately following the live stream on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, anywhere you can get your podcast fix. We are on it. Uh, go to roguewavepodcast.com to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts. Tonight, the Snyder Cut sets bad precedent, Fifth Element Retro Review, and Comic-Con lives, but should it? I'm your host, Michael Dolce, as always, joined by my cohort extraordinaire in crime. See, that's your new name, your cohort and my cohort in crime, because we're all wearing masks. Mr. Hassan, Lord of the Livestream Godwin, how you doing, sir? Yeah, uh, quarantine. Yeah, my quarantine jokes right? are, are failing. <laughs> yeah, failing, failing a little bit. I am, I am definitely um, over, over the quarantine. Uh, I'm not doing anything rash, and I'm not being, uh, you know, stupid about things. But mentally, yeah, no, mentally, I am. Uh, I'm not even. Che- I'm like checked off. Like that. <laughs> it's not even checked out. There is just checked off at this point. But hey, we get new content coming in 2021. Uh, last week we were here uh, when a lot of people first... say that as if they don't really realize how far away 2021 is. So we are not even in the middle. No, I know of 2020 yet. I know. You know? So I mean, it's it's a ways off. That's over nine months away. I know. You know? I know. The so, good, I mean, look. The good news is the summer weather has been helping. Uh, people are starting to actually socialize again. Distance, distancing at least, but but there is some socialization going on. And, uh, and hopefully there, you know, the things, you know, kind of go away, uh, perhaps until the fall and then maybe the fall, it's not as bad as people say, cause things change. News changes all the time. I'm just being optimistic. I'm not saying it's going to be and just, you know, hopefully. And, uh, and then we look back on, on this two to three month time in history as a footnote, right? That's Mr. Optimism. Footnote. You're entitled to be optimistic. I just mean, trying. you know. <laughs> just trying my best here. So anyway, last week we were here, and uh, this segment is our rogue rage, all the rage in the pop culture world, and the only rage in the pop culture world right now, uh, minus some you know dog walker yelling at a comic book artist, which we don't need to go into in detail. <laughs> yeah, let's let's not. <laughs> all the rage in the pop culture world is focusing on the Snyder Cut. Now, last week, you know, we went on air the day it was announced that it was coming to HBO Max. Uh, we did have a story prep because we had heard rumors, and it was, it was weird. It was one of those things where it's like, you know, it used to be like, you know, user X, you know, 9 Shinobi 1 said on Reddit that he heard from a producer who heard from a, you know, that, that the Snyder Cut was coming, and you're like, all right, yeah, this thing's it's not really coming. Yeah, for but the longest it, time, people were in denial that there was even a Snyder Cut or that right. a Snyder Cut would actually be anything worth wanting to see you know right. that would that wouldn't even be different enough from the whedon cut that it would it would be of any that it would be of any relevance right yeah so for a while it was it was one of those you know folklorish uh you know things that we would always love to hear about but but you'd, you'd never think would but come probably to never never experience right. right but then rumors got a little bit louder and louder and louder leading up to tuesday and by Wednesday, it was confirmed it will be on HBO Max. So real quick, obviously, I'm sure our audience kind of knows what the deal with it is, but found this article. I thought it was pretty interesting. Just more specifics about it. HollywoodReporter.com. It will be an entirely new thing. Zack Snyder's 20 million plus Justice League cut. So it's something that, you know, we had our guest on last week, Steve Ovecki, who asked, you know, would Warner Brothers actually put money into this? According to reports, it could be anywhere between 20 and 30 million to finish up CGI finish up some scenes and to actually bring the actors in for some audio re-recording as well too. So that is a tip. That is a, a thing that generally happens where the actors have to come in and uh, you know, maybe their lines are a, a little garbled or the audio, the mic just didn't quite pick up the conversation. They actually have to go and overdub uh, their, their dialogue. And so they are going to have to go ahead and do this. Um, the big thing I thought from this article that I thought was kind of, interesting and uh two things and one will lead into the next point we're going to talk about was they're thinking about doing it as six chapters so maybe four to six chapters so it's actually an episodic format versus a cut 
so to speak, an actual movie cut. Which, yeah, which it's going to be like a, it's going to be like a Netflix show. Yeah, you know, like a streaming. It's going to be like a season of a TV. So show. there's a number of reasons I'm against this cut being released in general. Um, oh. And again, we'll get to that. Uh, it's a new take. We'll get next. But if you're going to literally do something new, and that's what Zack Snyder is kind of reportedly saying, um, I think it's actually kind of interesting to do it in a way that is different. So I'm not just sitting there with a side-by-side comparison to Joss Whedon's you know, horrible mashup, which, which, again, I'm not even blaming Joss Whedon for the mashup. You know, the WB executives, this is supposedly they, you know, he bowed out because of his daughter's suicide, which tragic in and of itself. Um, but then there's a large contingent that kind of said that WB executives kind of, it you know. Pushed, yeah, the pushed consensus is that they well. pushed him out so that they could get Whedon in because Whedon did uh, Avengers. Right. And so Whedon is a big name. And then, you know, on, on characteristically, very, very much of the character of Hollywood, they believed it was the director or the name of the director or the brand that the director brought yeah. that made the product so... Um, so prevalent and so 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 uh, so well received. Yeah, and basically, it's the material. It's always the right. material. Right. I mean, the director is a big part of it, but the it's director's the director's great for marketing execs who want to spin why someone should go see this movie. But ultimately, if the movie's terrible, <laughs> uh, there's no there's nothing you can do that's going to change that. Which was proved by Whedon because yes. he he tried to do Justice League and it was not nearly as you know, yeah, and again, the, the, I don't blame. I'm not going to sit here and, and blame him for the for the outcome either. I, I think anytime you bring somebody in, you know, three fourths of the mean, way I'm in not ta- to completely redo it, it's going to be a disaster. You know, I'm not talking about been... him so much as I'm talking about the mentality yes. that he would he would make it popular even if it wasn't that good. Right, right. No, I agree with that, I, and I just think I think that that's that's an unwinnable situation. He should know better, to be honest with you. I, I think at that point, you know, well, I, at the I, time if, if he I'm was him, having. He's having trouble with Marvel at that time, That's right? True. And he's having his own little PR kind of nightmare, right? Well, wasn't he going to do like a Batgirl movie too? I think something like that. But his his uh, his ex wife had the, he divorced his oh, wife. Oh, well, that was yeah, that was that whole thing Yeah, and said on. that he wasn't really a feminist, and you know, like a lot of stuff was going on. So I think it was a PR refuge for him to just jump into. It was it was it was better coverage for him. Yeah, you know, it was like so he could jump into. Uh, he could jump into Justice League and have everybody start buzzing about whether or not Warner Brothers screwed over uh, Zack Snyder. And he kind of he kind of gets out of that unscathed, you know? Yeah. And then if it doesn't work out for him, it's it's studio interference, right? But that's, and if and it so, does work, then he's a genius. I mean, it's win-win for Joss Whedon, no matter yeah. what he, you know, what, what position he took with that. That's the part of this that, to me, though, gets... Gets, I, look, I understand from a marketing point of view. I, I know, uh, shout out to Joey Stone, who uh, commented on my Facebook feed when I, when I posted a couple articles about this. You know, what's not to, you know, what's not to love from DC's angle, from WB's angle, you know, basically take something that's basically finished, you know, invest a little bit, a couple dollars into it, and drop it, and you get all the buzz. Because right now, there's no new content coming out. So it's really, it's capturing a market right now in terms of anticipation and buzz that, nothing else like it can right. I get okay. it from that angle but from a reverse angle this is a movie that WB executives wanted nothing to do with when it first came out I mean when it and this is before Whedon I'm talking about when it, when it was first shown to them I mean it was you know Snyder had made Man of Steel which is questionable a questionable Superman movie for a lot of fans I know you liked it right I I liked it I I'm not didn't a huge like it fan. I'm not a huge Superman I, guy, so there's a lot about it I like. Yeah, but I didn't like it overall. There's a yeah. lot of good stuff in it, but they they missed some. I wasn't trying to be accusatory thing. either. Like you liked it, I was. No, I, I get you. Yeah. I get. I you know, COVID. I'm I'm really just I'm just really easy going now. I'm just, <laughs> oh. I'm just I'm just so happy to be speaking the- to another human <laughs> being that I don't really get. <laughs> Uh, so, so even if you did accuse me, I'm like, yeah, it's okay, Mike. Hassan's okay. going to start his own podcast after this. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me with Hassan. Guy. Yes, please, somebody, <laughs> anybody. Um, it's um, it's it was there's there there are fundamental things wrong with the narrative. I think yeah. the story is very flawed. 
I think the special effects are great. The other thing I did not like is that for some reason it was like disaster porn. You know, it was like, um, it was like, why isn't Superman saving people? Like, you know, Superman should literally be losing these fights because he's trying to save these people. Right. And instead he's just, he's laying into the the Kryptonians. Like he's been waiting for that his whole life, you know, screw the people. So it's, I, I got my issues with it, but it's a very, I like the, I like the approach. There's certain I wasn't things bored I, during it, and I, wa- and I no. wasn't, and I wasn't turned off. And I like looking because, again, at I'm Superman not a huge from, Superman guy, so to me it was, it was entertaining to see a different take on him, for sure. I like, I like seeing Superman um, through the eyes of skeptical people. You yeah. know, like, you know, after 9-11 type Americans. Like, sure. hmm, that's cool what you did. But any minute now, you could change your mind and and nuke all of us. So, hmm, you know. Yeah. And I and I like that. Um, I I like this both about uh, Man of Steel and Batman versus Superman. The premise for Batman versus Superman is so good. If you it, like, take the actual outcome because of there's what a that dubiousness about right. Superman. There's a like, hmm, you know, and right. and it's it it's it, the cool thing is we see him through the eyes of Lois. You mm-hmm. see him at his job. You yep. see him taking crap from uh, from from uh, Perry, you know, and so uh, you're you're like, all right, he's you know, if he if he was volatile and he nuked people, he would not be taking yeah. you know crap from any of these people. But then also, it's good to the it's good that the the senators and everything were like, hmm, but what if Superman decided to change his mind? Like that, those right. are thoughts that we will we all would be having, right? Right. So that was interesting. Again, interesting take, execution. Whew. Well, the, the, the longer version of Batman versus Superman explains That's what we needed Batman. in that movie, was it for it to be longer? Well, yeah, but I'm saying it explains that movie. Now, yeah. that doesn't make that a good movie. No. But, I mean, the longer version at least makes, it, makes you understand what's going on as opposed yeah. to the shorter version where – it's not a good movie and you don't understand what's going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I, I mean, there's definitely something to that extent. But that's the funny part. We've had two movies that he's done in the universe. Both of them, you know, the, the arrow was woo, pointing down at this point. And now all of a sudden, because of the mess that WB made in general, and again, this is only speculation because he did go through a personal tragedy, so I don't want to take anything away from that personal tragedy as the, as the impetus for him being removed from the film of, of removing himself. Um, right. You know, but that being said, it just felt like it felt like because of the critical response to that. And don't forget suicide squad two was taking place within this universe that he kind of, kind of like built. Um, well, okay. It didn't help. Didn't help matters either. Right. So the point by justice league coming out. It's like, you really think it's a good idea to have this guy? I don't. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't really, I look here's, Let's let's break it down into, um, into the simplistic, and non-artistic uh, way of looking at all of this stuff. Nothing says success like success, right? Yeah. Um, we found that out with George Lucas, right? George Lucas made the prequels. Many many people did not like the prequels. They right. you know they 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 felt that the prequels were garbage. They felt that suddenly George Lucas and his contributions were garbage, and they were reevaluating how much creativity he actually. Um, how much creativity he actually oversaw in the original movies because he was able, right. if he was capable of making movies that bad and in, right. as, as pertains to the prequels. The sequels come out. A lot of people don't like the sequels. A lot of people consider them soulless or aimless, you know, whatever. Now they planless. Start, <laughs> huh? planless. Planless. Aim, well, that's what I meant by aimless. But <laughs> So now they're reevaluating... Lucas's contributions, yeah, right, because nothing says success like success, and nothing says failure like failure. Right now, the thing is, you can't call Lucas a failure, and you can't call you can't call Disney Star Wars a failure financially, right? So right. we only have our own feelings um, to to you know to to use as a gauge sure. as to which is right and which is wrong. But that's that's the point. So Snyder, nobody's liking the Snyder vision right Mm -hmm. man of steel dubious but you know it was a success batman versus superman wasn't was a a mess you know yeah okay and so 
uh, you got uh, you got Justice League comes out. They switch, they swap for whatever reasons because mm-hmm. there's so many reasons given given to us. Um, right. And I don't believe I do believe at least for for uh, Snyder that his family problem is the main reason that he left. I don't know. Yeah, I, and you know, yeah, I agree. The, he was pushed out for various other reasons, but as pertains to Snyder, right. he had the one reason to leave, and it was a good reason for himself and for right. his family. So then they bring in another superstar director to come in and save the DCEU, mm-hmm. right? And that doesn't work. So see, nothing says success like success and nothing says failure like failure. If that didn't work, now everybody's clamoring for, we wanted to get back to yeah, Snyder's original it's, vision. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's, but to me, you know what? I, more it's, so it's than fickle. just that. Yeah, it's more, more so than just than that, amazing. though. And this is an article that came out on The Beat. Um, a couple days ago, releasing the Snyder Cut sets a troubling precedent. And I actually don't disagree with a lot of this. Um, The gist of this particular article kind of focuses on the toxic fandom that kind of occurred. Uh, The fact remains a loud portion of the release of the Snyder Cut fandom did hurt people. Critics and executives were harassed via social media. Some were even driven off those platforms. The history of harassment is well documented. Any community, including fan communities, is bound to have its share of bad apples, but it's hard to shake the feeling that by releasing the Snyder Cut, Warners is actually giving in to the bullies. Uh, Toxic fandom has been a problem since long before the phrase entered the popular lexicon. Uh, Only with new technologies, it seems to get worse. What it really comes down to is an intense sense of ownership over one's interests. Some people's people's identities are so tied to their favorite TV shows uh, or sports teams or video games, they feel compelled to fiercely protect these things they hold so dear. If that means targeted online harassment, gatekeeping, or even death threats, so be it. I'm not going to necessarily go into I'm not going to disagree with anything they said there. The idea of toxic fandom, though, online to me, A, existed well before social media. Uh, if, if anybody well, understood what, the, what, media, what message boards were, mm, they were just, mm. they were a cesspool of, of keyboard muscle comments mm. where people could just be whatever they want to and say whatever they want to because they're hiding behind a keyboard and an yeah. anonymous username. You know, there's Shinobi 717. I, I don't <laughs> knock any people out there who have a Shinobi avatar. That just seems to be what comes <laughs> to my mind. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, I don't know you, why. I, what I, are you I, saying? I don't, I don't know why that seems to be popping into my, into my yeah. head. Perhaps, I had, perhaps you, in 1997, like? I had an experience with Shinobi 1717. Yeah, probably. And uh, that's, 797. That, that's a hard avatar to forget. It really is. <laughs> So, so again, it's, it's existed out there. It's keyboard muscles, whatever. Yeah. What I'm going to go in where it's a dangerous precedent, and actually I'm not even going to use the word dangerous, actually. So, so really they're, they're talking about dangerous. This to me is going to fully demonstrate that social media, social media is absolutely useless in determining what people want. You and I have had conversations offline, uh, political conversations surrounding how if social media was really true – There'd be different people in offices. There'd be different people, you know, uh, and right, right. Because what it's really doing is you're giving into a fandom that I don't know actually exists. And again, look, I'm talking totally bubble centric right now, but people in my bubble, they didn't want this movie. No one wanted this movie. Now we're kind of curious. There's a curiosity factor. Wow, they're releasing it. I I might check it out for that for that lone reason. But there's no one that looks back on Batman v Superman and goes. Now there was a movie that got shafted by critics. <laughs> you know, it was like, right, right, right. Oh, that was a bad we, movie. We talked about this with um with with uh, Captain Marvel, right? In a get yeah. woke, go broke kind of situation, and then the movies. You know, sometimes the movies, sometimes the movies flop, but sometimes they go on to make a billion dollars. So yeah. it's not a you know the it's it's usually the product. It's not the online fervor Correct. that's a gauge. You know, because yeah. if it were, Rise of Skywalker wouldn't have been a billion dollar movie. Because right. there was nothing but vitriol for Disney Star Wars uh, leading into Rise of Skywalker. True. You know? and, and we already had the solo failure yep. to, to, to kind of buoy everybody into thinking that, you know, we had sway over, you know, how these movies were going to do. And obviously we don't. Yeah, solo um, failed because it came out three months or I agree. five months after one of the most controversial Star Wars uh, and potentially not a good film for, for at least 50% of fandom broke, out there. It, there was 150 reasons why. It broke the, it broke the, the scheduling. It broke their, yep. their way of doing things. Yep. It came out too soon. Even if, even if uh, Last Jedi was a, 
and Last Jedi made a billion dollars, right? But even I agree. if it was even a, if, it was even a, if Last Jedi was a critical, like yeah, universally yeah. praised, I think it would have struggled only because it's ah, too close. Well, maybe not. It might not have, but it was still too close. It was. It was at that point you're like, and wow, it's a, it's a solo. It's a Han Solo movie with not without Han without Solo Harrison Ford. I know. You know. I know. So I mean, look, I like Solo, you know, but I'm yeah. saying all these things now. Here's the thing. I think what's causing this is a is an absolute desperation for content. Yeah, we can. We need to. We need to make this streaming well, see, service happen it's that, because it's though. HBO Max. We want to get this service off the ground. We yeah. need content. We cannot. We don't have I shows hope, because I hope pers- that's what it is. Though I hope that's what it is, and it's not. What else? Can it be? According because according to this it's, article, it's not social media. No, what but else it is. According it be? to this article, and I wrote and I and I and I, I pegged this. But in. you just said I'm just going off of what oh, you said. Yeah, yeah, you just said it. It makes social media irrelevant. No, I hope it makes social media irrelevant. I hope that that the aftermath of this shows why a studio should never give in to quote unquote public pressure because the public doesn't exist on social media. Social media, you don't know how many people that, and this is why I even kind of, I don't want to discredit the harassment angle. We don't even know if those people are real. We don't know if they're burner accounts. We don't know if they're bots. We don't know. I mean, I once was about to engage in a political argument on Twitter, which I never do, uh, with a robot, with a robot. I ended up looking, I was like, oh, this person has no followers and has no anything, has never posted. This is not a real person. Like, I had to actually go and check, you know, because they just made such an outlandishly triggering statement to something I had posted once. And, I, yeah. and, and the instinctive which, which reaction... Which designed to trigger you. Exactly. Right? And right, the instinctive yeah. reaction then is to get me, a real person, to start reacting, which then gets other people reacting, which then gets other bots reacting, and it just and it and it causes this fervor. That's the actual truth of all this. So again, I don't want to discredit the harassment angle, but we don't even know how much of that harassment was done by living people uh, versus versus robots versus AI versus things that were designed to to stop you. But what it does do, though, is you know the WB executive is quoted in this article saying people seem to really want this thing. No. Nobody wants this thing. There's no one that wants this thing. That's Yet, not, that is not necessarily true. In terms of percentages, uh, I can, the vast majority, at least, that I feel oh, want boy. this. And I think that's, that's what's mis- going to end up happening. We're that's the be- same mistake that they're making now about, the, about whether a majority wants what the majority wants or whether they don't. I mean, we just don't know that. Well, no, we, that the problem is we'll, we will not know. Right. Until it comes out. I know. You know? I, but that's the thing, though, right? Is it going to drive me to pay 15 bucks a month to watch HBO Max? I don't know. Um, you know, are they well, going to see the subscribers? that's what they're banking on. But I, well, think, I, I know I, that's what they're banking on, but that's what I'm saying. That's going to be the I don't result. think they would be focusing on this if they had content. Well, They're if, trying if, to get HBO ask, Max off the ground, and, they, and, they, and they, can't, they can't commission television content because nobody's making any shows at the moment. Or they're, gonna just, they're just starting to make shows. HBO Max effectively has three types of content. Um, this was actually just launched today, uh, this morning, that they, they broke this down. Uh, Max, it's HBO programming, Max Originals, and library titles. Uh, Max Originals are meant to com- complement the HBO programming by taking swings outside of the usual comfort zone, which, ironically for HBO, that's, I can't imagine what that means, um, while letting the HBO brand signify the quality program in the cable channels known for. Uh, the new originals include titles for kids like Looney Tunes, comic book adaptions like Doom Patrol, and scripted shows like Love Life, which features, uh, I think it's not Anne. Uh, who's Anna Kendrick? I kept wanting to say Anna yeah. Paquin, and that's not right. Yeah. Uh, reality shows like The Big Shot with Bethany. Uh, the company's also creating a new film studio, Warner Max, which will, create, will, uh, be, will create a bit, about 10 mid-budget films for the service each year. You know, when I stumble on words sometimes when I'm reading, Mm. Uh, it's usually my fault. This was actually the, the article itself did not have real words in that sentence. I just wanted to point <laughs> that out. Uh, the HBO shows and library content, HBO programming like Veep and Game of Thrones is included, of course. And Warner Media is folding in library content from the cable channels, including TNT and True TV. Um, oh, yeah, there's a little show called Friends, uh, which is also going to be on it. And, um, and Harry Potter. Um, HBO has licensed the Harry Potter um, you know, that's what I'm saying. Look at look at all the content they want to pack it with. You know, they want to they they want to compete with yeah um, Amazon and Netflix, right? Yeah, and they want to try to get the drop on um, uh, Disney, 
because Disney, even Disney, kind of floundering with their with their content. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. as 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 diverse and as uh, robust as the Disney content is. Yeah, it's still you know it's it's, it's still a once over. You know, right. you go through all these things once, and then you're like, all right, well, that was great. Less like you, you have kids. So you can sit them in front of the TV and, and just replay Disney over and over again. Right. But for adults, you know, most adults aren't going to be like, oh, right now it's all right, power I've, players. I've seen Maleficent. So, I, which I actually um, got to hand it to my son. He managed to find the most obscure cartoon. And it's actually a pretty cool cartoon. Um, it reminds me of like when I found Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles before it kind of like broke big. It was like on like Sunday mornings. And I used to like literally get up religiously to watch Mutant Ninja Turtles, not realizing that. I guess everyone was because then they yeah, ended up putting on like daytime phenomenon, but there's a cartoon network show called power players. And that's, that's our, that's our, you know, put on, put on, um, repeat viewing, uh, right now. But yeah, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see. I, I guess we're going to have to wait and see till 2021 at that point. They're not going to have the leverage though of the quarantine viewer. That's the part that also kind of gets me. It's like, if it was done, right. If it was literally done, they could put it out tomorrow. But the fact that it's not going to be out until 2021 suggests they really are putting money into this. Um, and, and they're going to put money into something based off of social media, which, again, is, is, is at least my standpoint, and I think yours as well, that it's not real. Like, it's not real. It's, it, no. This is not the real pulse of what actually people are going to end up. You know, well, doing. yeah, and we'll see, you know, and we'll find that out. You know, yeah. I don't think it's a real gauge. I think I think every time you try to use the the social media as a prediction uh, model, yeah, you're gonna go wrong. Yeah, you know, because you're just you're just not you just don't have the metrics that you think you do. Um, it's loud voices in a in a in a in a in a giant room. That doesn't mean everyone's talking. You know, yeah. um, but I mean. It's, it'll give us something to talk about. So, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not against it. We are thrilled that he released that because then <laughs> if not, we would be stuck just doing retro reviews. That was the Rogue Rage. When we come <laughs> back, retro review, fifth element, five reasons. It was one of the greatest sci-fi movies to be released and five, that, five reasons why it wasn't when we come back. <laughs> Welcome back to the Rogue Wave podcast. We talk comics, movies, TV, and pop culture and the disruptors behind it. Every Wednesday, 8 p.m. on Facebook.com slash Rogue Wave podcast and Twitch.tv slash Rogue Wave podcast. Then it is immediately turned into a podcast that you can download on all major podcasting apps. Go follow us on Spotify, Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Google. Hit the subscribe button. really helps us out, and we really appreciate it. All right, this is the final installment of our May mega movie blockbusters of yesteryear. Uh, we call it the Rogue Retro series. We've done, we've picked some uh, retro movies, movies that have come out in the past. Uh, we started off with all three Star Wars movies, uh, all, all three Star Wars sequels in a row uh, as one film, reviewed all three of them. Uh, we touched on Iron Man, which was a pretty cool look back to a movie I have not seen since I think it first came out, uh, but was such a, so instrumental in launching an entire you know, movie universe. Last week was Temple of Doom, which was a lot of fun. And we're going to file out the door of the May movie blockbusters of, your, of yesteryear with an infamous movie. No, I'm just kidding. A movie that is dubbed by some to be the greatest sci-fi movie of all time. Oh. The Fifth Element. Wow. Yes. It does it a disservice. That does it a very big disservice because it's... So my own personal history with Fifth Element is one that I never saw it in the theaters. It was one that was on HBO constantly when I was a teenager because it came out in 97. And I'm not a teenager, I guess. Uh, it came out in 97. Uh, and then it would always be on HBO in, in like the immediate years that followed because I don't, I don't think it did very well in the box office, uh, you know. If I recall correctly, it was a, it's more of a cult hit and I used to enjoy it. I used to just catch it mid, I used to catch it mid movie. And I think it's a movie that I've, I've watched in pieces that if you totaled up all the pieces, I've probably watched it in full, like, you know, 
15, 20 times now, uh, but just in different, in different, you know, varying degrees of pieces. So it's kind of cool to go back. It was more nostalgic for me to go back and watch it only because it brought back that time for me, you know, 20 years ago yeah. where I would, you know, catch it late night. Then it was for an actual cinematic experience where it was, it was fun. It was exactly the way I remembered it. There was nothing new that I took from rewatching Fifth Element that versus maybe say Iron Man where I looked at it and go, boy, I, I don't know if some of those scenes could take, you know, could happen right now and kick off the Marvel universe the way it was supposed to be done or Temple of Doom, uh, which, you know, I, it, I made myself see it in a different light only because of what it was supposed to be. Fifth Element, though, I don't know. Am I, am I not? Fifth Element off of a $90 million budget made $263.9 million, no, $263. million okay. USD. Okay. So, so it did do well. Yeah. Just, just, to, just so we can have a little facts on our side. Um, well, facts get in the way of a good story. Yes, I, I agree with you. Um, look, uh, well, wait, wait, is... wait, hang on. Let me, let oh, me append this. Oh, let me append oh. my, my train of thought though. Oh. All right. Go it, ahead. It lived on in cult status way more than when it first hit the block, the box office. It wasn't like you sit there and go like 1997 was the year of fifth element to me. I is grant that you that. Statement? It was like 1997 was a crazy year anyway, but yes, I grant you that it was a big hit, but I mean, also. Also, I think I think one of the powerful aspects about it was that there wasn't any movies like that out at the time. Yeah. We were we weren't doing sci-fi movies, mm-hmm. you know, very very big in '97, and then we had the Fifth Element, and then we had Starship Troopers. There's you know a bunch of stuff sci-fi. I was trying to think. Broke. We had Independence Day the year before. That was a massive success. Yeah, I, but I'm it's saying not the it, same. I know. No, it was. But I mean, sci-fi was like it was between '96 um, to to the 2000 that started a boom of sci-fi, you know, yeah. uh, um, independence day, uh, judge dread. Yeah. You know, I think judge dread was 95, right? Um, 96. That's something. Yeah. But you're, you're in the ballpark. Yeah. I think it was 95. Um, and, uh, you know, then independence day you'd have, you, you we get about one of these blockbusters a year. Yeah, you know, basically, it wasn't the proliferation of sci-fi that we that we kind of often tend to see. Well, we don't see it now because comic book movies have taken over everything. But most of them are sci-fi movies. Yeah. Most of them could be uh, arguably called sci-fi movies. So it was it was kind of a big deal in its day. I will full disclosure say I didn't like it when I first saw it. Me personally, How dare so I get where you're coming from with it. It took a it took a little while for me to get on on the on the Sith Element bandwagon. I, like yeah, I enjoyed it, it was, but I'm not you know I never sat there going like this is the greatest sci-fi movie of all time. Kind of kind of no, no it was, I never it was campy that. and kitschy and you know colorful and it was cool. Like it was just it was it was it's it's the, to me it's the perfect like I'm awake at eleven o'clock at night. I'm twenty years old. What's on TV? Oh, here's Chris Tucker yelling at at uh, Bruce Willis. Awesome. Sign sign me up. Judge Dredd was 1995. Okay. Crack staff. I love it. <laughs> um, it's, it's the internet. It's, uh, it's amazing. Have you, mm-hmm. have you heard of it? Have you used it? It's, I, it's, it's stunning. I went on once, but Shinobi717. Uh, <laughs> he chased you out. You know, just <laughs> you out. I hate that guy. Damn you, or Shinobi. <laughs> or, or them or they. You know, yeah, you whoever, know, whoever, know they are. whoever the Shinobi are. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a small organization of <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, there's a, there's a conference room of people just sitting there going, we got him! <laughs> <laughs> hey! Um, be awesome. but they're, I, they're micro-sized, too. They're, like, microscopic. <gasps> That's a new book. The thing, is, the thing about this fifth element is, is there are a lot of things about the fifth element that you will, you will not notice your first time watching it. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, almost 30 years ago, um, you're kind of... No, not 30 years ago. Almost. 20. 20. 23. That leans closer to 20 than 30. Almost 30 years. In, in by, by uh, what, when, when did it come out? 97? Yeah. In seven years, it'll be 30 years. Yeah, I know. So that's yeah. 30 years. Almost well, 30 but, years but ago. It's closer to 20. So even you could say 25 years ago, and that's acceptable. 
It's got to be within a two to three year range for it to be there. Anyway, 23 years ago, they didn't have, what you were going to say? I don't care anymore. The sci-fi, the, you know, the CGI, <laughs> it's very true, though. No, the CGI back in I'm not even talking about the CGI. I was talking about something else. I don't know why you get stickler for these stupid things. All right, never mind. It doesn't matter. Long time ago, you know, <laughs> whatever. The F. Um, I don't even know what point I was going to make now. I forgot Gary Oldman was in it. And his turn as the bad guy is one of the highlights of this article I found to kind of just kind of bolster the review. Because, again, I, I, it's one of those movies to me that, again, some people are so passionate about. And I can watch it and just enjoy it on a complete surface level and be good with it. Like, there's nothing deeper for me personally to watch it. So I, watched, I, I read this article from Screen Rant and said five reasons why it's the greatest sci-fi movie of all time and five reasons it wasn't. And one of the reasons they gave that it wasn't first, I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of them. Uh, one, it's a cheerful glimpse of the future. Uh, you know, many sci-fi films choose to use monochromatic color schemes and dark and digital, you know, very, um, um, what's the movie? Uh, oh boy, 2049 just came out a couple years ago. Ryan Gosling and Harrison Ford, Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049. You know, like everything is everything, you know, LA is a, is a deep cesspool and everything's horrible. Uh, this film Everything was colorful. Everything kind of reminded me, color scheme wise, of um, Total Recall, the original Total Recall, like being on Mars. Like I kind of felt like it, it, to me, it had that same, it had that same vibe to it. Um, but that's one of the reasons they loved it. Um, they said it's comedic. That's another reason why they thought it was really good because it's, it was actually really funny and it was nice. Um, but one of the reasons that they, you know they gave for it not to be good though is the hero and villain never actually meet zorg and corbin dallas never actually meet and uh zorg sorry for spoilers if anybody hasn't seen it dies when the aliens blow up the ship which is unheard of in the sci-fi genre but is a change that uh, makes this film set apart so actually i think they were they were touting that's a good thing uh so i stand corrected but <laughs> what do you think about? I mean, what do you think about that? Maybe, I forgot Gary Oldman was even get in. Get your facts straight. How do you forget Gary Oldman is in Fifth Element? <laughs> I just, okay. it, it, I just didn't remember. I just couldn't remember who that was as the as the oh. main villain in the movie. And it and it, when I think back to Fifth Element, I never think about oh yeah, yeah Gary Oldman was in that movie. I only think about you know. It was one of his first like you know I mean it wasn't when it wasn't his first movie but it was one of his. First, becoming a mainstream. Plus, Luc Besson is his guy. The guy Luc Besson launched Gary Oldman. He put him no, in. No, Bram, well, Bram Stoker's Dracula, ninety-two. That was Gary Oldman. That's that's the Gary Oldman. You know, that's not his first movie, though. No, I know. You know? I mean, that's, that's not that to me is his first big big movie. But I mean, the professional like Gary Oldman has had like a lot of like long-standing work, sure. especially you know, it, and, and it a lot of these things showcased his range of being able to be an actor mm -hmm. just also like a true romance you know so which you don't even remember he was in he, so i mean it wasn't just dracula i mean dracula is when he kind of became because of that movie becoming a success that's when he hit the mainstream but yeah. i mean then he went into niche you know he started doing movies like you know independent movies like the professional also for luke Besson and yeah. And then he started getting quirky. <laughs> Let me see if you which, agree with this. Actually. Which is his role as Zorg in uh, the fifth element. The number one reason they said not so great is the plot is poor. It was already mentioned the film had too many cliches. That was earlier in the article. They said there's too many cliches in the film. Too many cliches for what? In comparison but part, to what? Well, all right. I'll go, I'll go up. Here is the here is the. Um, that's, a, that's a bad critique. Cliches can cliches. be a good thing when used in moderation, but this film went through several of them. Corbin Dallas is a masculine man who can't be defeated and the villain wants to destroy, but with no clear reason why. Fans also watch the typical flying cars and futuristic rooms where the beds fold up into walls, which seem fairly basic for a film of this magnitude. Fairly basic. It wasn't yeah. really that basic in 1997. Yeah. So that's a stupid critique. But a lot of these critiques are, are contemporary critiques. Yes. You know? Which that's doesn't ours. make any freaking sense. Right. Like you can't judge it contemporarily. And right. if you do, then you put it in the in the pantheon of things that that created a trope, 
not the things that suffer from X trope. You mm. know, it, that's. It's He's already mentioned the film had too many cliches, but part of that is due to the fact the plot was poorly written. Storyline was as basic as they come with the masculine guy helping the girl and saving the day from the evil villain. That's yes, the hilarious dialogue helps make up for this, although fans felt it was still staring them in the face. There was so much more that could have been done with the film, but the storyline only worked to hinder its success. No, oh, hinder its $200 million success. I mean, <laughs> look, of a, that's... Off of a $90 million budget. That, to okay. me, really is a contemporary uh, okay. <laughs> critique of it, though, because... It's, I mean, to say that it's like you, that's because we were you have a man about the saving internet. a woman that you're now all of a sudden, you know, uh, a cliched. I, I mean, that's and she saved the world, you know. So it wasn't even. It's not even like Corbin Dallas actually stopped the destruction of the world. He just right. he just facilitated it, but she stopped it, you know. I mean, and she, you know, she's pretty kick ass that whole film. Yeah. So I don't understand. Well, this this article is written by Rebecca O'Neill and did and was released this year. So yeah, you are definitely getting a contemporary, a contemporary yeah that's, review those, from a woman writer. And now maybe it doesn't le- delegitimize oh, her her really care opinion her on gender. it. Gender. No, because if she's if she's if she's if the critique is it's a it's it's a cliched plot because as a masculine man that saves the girl, then yes, I I think her gender may shape her opinion on seeing something like this, even though it's 23 years after the fact that it came out. Uh, she may be it seeing it. It doesn't invalidate how she sees it. I, I, I said it did not invalidate the feelings. I'm merely saying that that is one of the ways it might've shaped her opinion on it though. Yeah, it's but speculation. We can't, know, we can't know that. No, I mean, we can't, I but I'm going to go, you... go a little bit bold here and say, uh, it's a, try to keep a the, masculine man, you're, a cliche. Yeah, but I mean, this we're this segment isn't on her opinion; it's on ours, right? So we're just using it as a basis. Um, we're using it as a jump start for the conversation that we're having. Yeah, right? I know. Like, so I mean, like, who cares? Like, even if me, I might, I didn't really like Corbin Dallas when I first saw him because I thought he was a John McClane ripoff. Yeah, I did too. Actually, I, I'm not. So gonna, I mean, it doesn't really it it. it uh, let's not get into that. Um, it's funny. Chris Tucker and Lilo, uh, Lilo are the two. I mean, those are the two. Like one of those things where you say, "Picture Fifth Element." What's the first thing that comes in your head? You know, I picture Chris Tucker. What? A, what a. Um, I don't call it a brave role for him or anything like that. But what a. Because it's such a a gender fluid character that he kind of represents. It's ahead of it's ninety seven. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's time. so it's. It is actually kind of a brave role for him at the time. Uh, I would I would speculate, especially did, not did having she been mentioned in a lot of that movies. in her article. She did not. She said mm-hmm. the film was funny. Hmm. <laughs> mm. It's contemporary. Funny. You know, like look, if if it's it's fine to have a contemporary view for other contemporaries, like as to whether or not you should watch this film, right? If you're if you're doing if you're twenty something. And you want to know if you're doing a, a vlog or an article about whether mm-hmm. other twenty somethings should watch particular movies, right? Yeah. And your then your opinion on it is absolutely valid, right? I don't know if you're gonna like this. I don't know as you know as a as a Gen a, a Gen Z, you know, or whatever, yeah. uh, you know, whether or not this actually fits in the, the pantheon of things that, that Gen Zs uh, uh, appreciate or whatever. That is completely valid. I have no issue with that whatsoever. You know you, you know your generation. Mm-hmm. If you're going to give an overall evaluation of, of a, the viability of a product um, overall in history, yeah. you know, and what it, what, it, you know, what it gave versus what it took away, you know, what it provided versus what it stole, um, then, you need, then you need a more in-depth analysis than what was offered because that's because yeah. that that analysis is crap and most <laughs> uh, most contemporary analysis analyses are crap because they they deal with a lot of uh popular tropes of the now and don't yeah. and and are not even conscious of it you know so you could say it's tropey because uh because it's got a masculine man saving a woman and that's a terrible trope and that, that's a terrible trope for today but tomorrow, 
the terrible trope will be criticizing things from 20 years ago for not having contemporary uh, sensibilities. You don't know what the tropes are going to be. Tropes are going to change. So right. maybe don't look at something that's from 20 years ago, 25, 30, whatever the heck, years ago. 23. And, and uh, yeah, at least I knew how much money it made at the box office yesterday. Very true. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> don't, maybe don't judge it. Don't look at 1930s King Kong and say it sucked because the special effects are bad. Yeah. It's not you're you're looking at it in a completely different lens. That that, that doesn't that doesn't gauge its value. Yeah. That gauges its entertainment value to you right now, but it doesn't gauge its worth in the in in the history of cinema, in the history of, you know, of of entertainment of of uh, of of celluloid stimuli. So, a lot of these contemporary reviews are terrible, you know? They're not they're <laughs> They're, they just are. They're terrible takes on films. And I don't really have an issue with um, this woman's opinion. I don't have an issue with her, you know, with her liking or disliking the masculine situation. I don't have an issue with her disliking, maybe disliking or theoretically disliking Bruce Willis's uh, contributions to the film. Because at the time, even I didn't like it. I didn't right. understand it was a parody of the action hero trope, sure. though. Um, which I, I believe it is. I believe the take on that is he's, he is over, um, he's overextended. He's, he's over hyper, uh, masculine and, and hyper capable because that's a trope of the, of the right. genre, you know, and it is actually making fun of Bruce Willis's previous career as John McClane and Joe Holland back and just about every other archetypical, uh, average Joe superhero that he played in the, in the late eighties, yeah. early nineties. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I took it as, but I had, it, it, it took a few viewings for me to realize, wait a minute, you know, this is, this is kind of a joke because everything in that movie is a joke, yeah. you know? And, um, it's so, funny. She said it's funny. Yeah. She said it's funny. I, I would say, honestly, she's entitled. She's absolutely entitled to her opinion of it and her opinions of it are not invalid and they're not wrong. I just don't agree with her opinions because I don't think she, she watched it through the proper lens. Yeah. Um, I think she's, she's absolutely correct that as entertainment for today, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really cut the mustard for kids I think today. It still does though. I think it has a strong I'm saying, character. I'm saying from a... her perspective, I can yeah. understand what she's saying about it. Not, not cutting the mustard for today, but if she's making an overall critique of it from the era that it came from, at yeah. the time that, you know, then, then it, this is an inaccurate uh, assessment of the value of the fifth element in my Real opinion. quick, would you uh, go rogue or go home on this movie? Go, uh, go rogue. It's totally Absolutely. rogue film, right? Like, I yeah. mean, it just really kind of does its own thing. Look, man, later in, in, later in life, a little late, watching that movie is a treat. It is absolutely, and, it's, and it is indelible. It is, yeah. it is one of those movies that have endured. If you say multipass, everybody knows that's from fifth element. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot, it, it has made a uh, profound impact on the sci-fi genre. So I like the, uh, the very young Luke Perry, you know, in the beginning of the that's pretty good. Okay. I've never heard Luke Perry being someone's favorite part of Fifth Element, but okay. No, I just, I like it. I didn't say favorite, I just I like it. I like okay. It. All right. When we come back, we go spinning the racks. Welcome back to the Rogue Wave Podcast, talking comics, movies, TV, and pop culture every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern on Facebook.com slash Rogue Wave Podcast. Uh, we love talking about the rogues behind all the stuff that you love to watch and read out there. Uh, we are big fanboys of comics and graphic novels, and every week we bring you the inside info and the source material that will make its way onto the large and small screen. We call this segment Spinning the Racks. 
Spin around, spin around. Tampa Bay Comic Con 2020 to go forward in July. This is from uh, multiple sources, but uh, the one I'm pulling from is the Spectrum News staff in Tampa. Uh, the Tampa Bay Comic Convention announced Tuesday. After two months of uncertainty, the Tampa Convention Center and Tampa Fire Marshal confirmed that TBCC 2020 will move forward with numerous health measures to keep attendees, exhibitors, guests, and staff safe. Uh, here are the measures that we put in place. Temperature screenings will be mandatory for all occupants prior to entering the convention center. Uh, those exhibiting temperatures above a certain level will not be allowed entry. Uh, they've increased cleaning and disinfection procedures in high traffic areas, such as elevators and escalators, handrails, benches, tables, handles, restrooms, and more. Hand sanitizing stations will be set through the pre-function space and high traffic areas. Interior occupancy of the exhibit hall, ballrooms, and meeting rooms shall be strictly limited with one-way ingress and one-way egress of all interior spaces. Be held July 10th to the 12th. Um, should this happen? I'm not, I wouldn't go. <laughs> but if you, if you build it, if you build it, uh, or was it if a convention takes place with no attendees, did it really ever happen? Yeah, if a tree falls in the wood. Uh, I... I mean, I'm curious to see what happens. It'll yeah. be good if we find out that it, that it is viable and they can work. So, but, but because of my position as to be one of the people who would not go, I, could, I cannot in good conscience say it's a good idea. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I've had some people kind of react and say this is ethically wrong to do it, and I don't understand the ethics behind it because I think... Because people can get sick and die. So, I mean, yeah, but it's, it but it's not like you're, f it, it's, you're not forcing people to, to no, go. No, but you're, exhibit. but by doing it, you're given, you're, you're allowing for, it's irresponsible for showrunners, just like it's irresponsible to open a movie theater right now. It's not, I mean, area, I mean if, it, if, if the area is not hard hit with cases and it's part of the, I mean, what about the responsibility of the business to still be there? You know, I mean, Theoretically, we, we, keep, uh, we keep operating yeah, on the Look at it this way. That. Everybody, you open a movie theater, people come, and then a, a, a great number of them break out and get sick, and then they sue the movie theater for being open, right? Now, you can argue you shouldn't have been there um, if, you, if you were worried about getting sick, but the argument probably wouldn't hold water. It's no, pretty it irresponsible. Would. No, huh? it absolutely would, it, especially if there's a notice. I think one of the things they're doing is there's a notification that, you know, by doing so, you're, you're entering at your own risk. I mean, that, that's one of the things that they're also going to have and, and they're going to do this for not just conventions but like a lot of so if, it's a, if, it, if you're going to put a, a notice up that you're entering at your own risk that you're that you're you know you're potentially making yourself sick at your own risk then it is irresponsible if a situation is dire enough for you to to put a disclaimer warning on it it is fairly irresponsible to no it's but it's responsible to it's responsible to acknowledge you asked me whether i thought it was or wasn't I just said so I'm you, I telling you, the ethics of it. I don't think it's ethically wrong to, to have to run a business. You know, I mean, I think at this point. Why well, ask me then? So I could debate that's what you, you think. Tell you that I'm doing wrong. This is the whole point of the show. Why be in the show? Oh, really? Yeah. Is that the point of the show? If we have I the same it's opinion, a good idea. it's not good for the show. We have differing opinions. Don't you do anything? Well, the whole idea is that I'd be able to finish my okay. freaking opinion mm. while I'm making it. But mm. it's okay. Mm. I don't really care about the subject. Let them go. <laughs> Let everybody go. I, Open everything up, I say. I, you know what, though? Thin, I mean, thin like, the herd. Thin <laughs> the herd. It, it depends. I mean, obviously, being New York City-based, uh, we're, we're at a different viewpoint. You especially being at a different viewpoint. I you, See, this is the thing I don't there. understand. You, everybody acts like... It's only happening there. It hasn't happened here. It can't happen here. It's, it's, it, only, it hasn't happened this severely anywhere else. But there's nothing that says it can't. Right. But and so I mean, the, the attitude the of it's okay, we can, we can go out and play again, is inaccurate. But, the, but it's not as if they're sitting there saying everything is back to normal. Come, come, come back out here and it's going to be exactly the I way it was. I didn't say it was. You asked you me if it was out. ethically wise to open, to have a convention, to have, to, there is no way that you can, if, if, if any, if the convention's any success, mm -hmm. right? In attendance, 
there is no way you could tell me people are going to be responsibly socially distancing in a convention. There's no way. There's no way. There's no All I can way. say is if, if the if that's that's a that's an opinion, first of all, it's subjective. It's projection. It's, it's, it's an it's opinion hypothesis. from someone who's worked conventions for twenty that. years. I understand that. I'm just merely saying that that's a that's a projection. That doesn't mean that the that the people So in now charge hypotheticals can't. aren't now we can't use I'm hypotheticals. I'm merely saying that right? okay. by saying that um, you're 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 taking away the amount of effort that the convention itself may Go I'm not sure taking anything safe. from anyone. That's hyperbolic. I am saying I do not believe that you can socially distance successfully at a show, regardless. I think there's going to be challenges for are. sure. Yeah, I think there's challenges. Regardless for sure. of your efforts, I don't think you will be successful at doing it. Yeah, I and think an indoor. If you look at the beaches and you look at you look at the yeah. parties, the beaches and stuff like that, and the bars, people are no, people are almost blatantly not socially distanced. I agree. But that's purpose. also, you know, again, an outdoor event versus an indoor event. Um, Indoors, outdoor, yeah, Action outdoors. Is, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So they act like that in an outdoor event. Indoors, where there's no way for anybody to be able to, to socially distance to get away from it, it's not responsible. I just, if you ask I, it's if it's responsible, it's interesting that they will do it. I'm interested to see what the results are. Yeah. I don't believe that they're going to successfully. I think you're going to have I, some I cases pop from this. I don't think there's any way you're not going to have. I had to see that's, that's just, all right, never mind. No, it's I, kind I, of I, callous. It's just a kind of a callous thing. If you're saying like you're, some people, let's just say, take it to the level of severity, right? Some people are going to die. I doubt it, but yeah. Could there's happen. no doubt. It's a deadly disease. Right, you, I, I, in order to gauge the the, the viability of something, order, and you decide that I and and you are you have pre existing conditions where it makes you more likely to die from it. Coming to the come, deciding I'm going to go to a comic con today and not socially distance and not wear a mask is irresponsible. Of the it's a deadly itself. disease, and there is there there are, but it's not the business. It's not it's not the conventions. Um. It's not being mm. irresponsible of the convention. Why? Because they're not forcing you to come to your show. They're, in fact, you are paying money to go there. Right. They are merely saying, hey, look, we're a convention. They're not Read Pop. They're not, they're not a, and which, by the way, Read Pop, it's not as if some those of the con- Some of the conventions, the, from some of the prior conventions before the shutdown were, were, were canceling. Yes. Why were they canceling? Because at the, the time we had no, we, we were, it was, everything was. But why would they cancel? Why would they cancel? For fear of the unknown, for fear because they, trust me when no when no I no. But what's, what's the fear of the unknown? What's the fear of the unknown? What is the finish the thought? What is the I am going to tell you. I'm going to illustrate it with an example though. When I went to C two E two, there was no temperature screenings at the door. There were no socially distancing. We didn't even know what it was. We didn't know what the thing was. You know, was capable. I know. I get that. But why did they so close? They, why didn't they, hang on? They why closed they because they anyway? did not know what the effects of the virus were because they didn't know how severe the virus was going to be. Now they do, and now they're allowed but to. But why, reopen. even if you don't know anything about the virus and you don't know what the effects of the virus are going to be, mm-hmm. why did they close? If they don't know anything, you not knowing anything is. Just are you a, saying just from just the street, are you trying to? Are you trying to intimate the the liability aspect? I'm asking why would you why would you close down? Well, a the they were all they were closed down because a lot of the places itself were banning large gatherings. So you couldn't even you literally by why, law couldn't though? go. Why? Yes. To protect the greater the greater nation at the time, at the time. Now we ha- now we have more knowledge. So then you believe then it should happen. So then there is there it is. I believe it should be allowed my, to open. Get off, get, I don't think it's then, ethically wrong for them to open. Okay. But ethically wrong. Okay. Great. Yay. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get the nature of this discussion. I don't think it's ethically wrong for it to open. You do. You I, think it, you I, yeah, think and it I is. do. So yeah. what? I'm just, I don't know. You're really what? just, you're really, you're really going behind the curtain here for my uh, debate podcast. Because you're here. being, because I think you're being callous about it. And I think, and, and I think you're trying to prove a point, a prove why it is good as opposed to why. Well, I didn't say good or bad. Okay. I didn't say good or bad. I don't. I don't care whether you what, what, how you how you parse but, but it. I don't. I don't really callous, care how you parse whether it. I think something is good or bad, and that's not my I, point. I whether, think people, whether, whether it's you said it, you don't mind. You you said it's not ethically wrong, right? I don't so think it's, it's not an ethical. So it's not no. an ethical bad. 
that means right. it's an ethical good. Okay? It does not mean it's an ethical good. It just means, uh, actually, I would say ethics have nothing to do with this. You asked if it was ethically right or wrong. That was the, that was the basis of your questioning. It's ethically or, it's you ethically asked right. me if it was ethically right or if I thought it was ethically right or wrong. That was the basis of your question in the first place. Is that right? should, no, no. So now you don't even think that ethics apply. Wrong. Now you don't, don't even think, think that ethics apply. I don't. I think using the word ethically in this. You means, used ethics. Yes, I used it because people have said that. And I'm, it and doesn't, I'm, okay, and that was, your, that was the basis of your questioning to me. Yes. That was the basis of your question to me. Yes. So, so asking me uh, whether or not it's ethical, I have to make a decision as to whether or not I agree on an ethical basis, right? right. So now in the midst of me explaining to you how I feel ethically it is not a good idea, you now decide, well, we're not talking about ethics. Do you think it's ethically right, wrong? Or not a good idea. If you said there's no such thing as a right used, or wrong, right? Or a good used, or bad. No, but I'm saying you use those terms of right and wrong in this discussion. And that's why I'm I, that's saying, where I, I said, have. I said, because you said it's an ethical good and I say it's an ethical bad, right? That's what I, that's how I simplified it. No, I, said I, it wasn't yeah, exactly. But I wouldn't call it ethically good or bad. I would just merely. You, okay. And then, you, say, and then after that, you said no, we weren't even talking ethics at all. Okay? I don't think ethics apply to. So what do you think does ethics, apply what it comes to down it. to is that the individual itself can choose to go or not to go. I think that it's, it is responsible. It is the responsibility of the convention center to make it as safe as humanly possible. So but why are restaurants closed? Yeah, but they're reopening. They're reopening. That's the whole point of this. We're not closed. We're reopening. I, and, and do I think that they should, that we should be reopening? I think at this point, I do think they, that we should. Because did I ask you, did you think so? Or did I say, should, did I think so? I do not think so. I so know. in the in the basis of this questioning, that's my attitude. I get you it. You disagree. I do. Fine. We can move on. <laughs> Next week. Ah, we'll, we'll think of something. Tune in. Love having you. <clears throat> Tune in on the Facebook f- uh, feed. Comment, like, share. We'll see you guys next week. Oh, wave.